the whole in out office return to work all of that other kind of stuff has changed most people's perception of what the nature of the workplace is and so i think that people that have returned to the office still see that environment somewhat differently than they used to if they work mm. at home and so i think i could be wrong but i think there's a greater focus now on maybe at the office but i've got a certain number of tasks to do and i'm going to do those things and so promoting people that help people get things done is a much better approach than just going for the old standard wow friendly extroverted outgoing you know charismatic rah rah um, that only goes so far especially if the person has to work closely with the team this is the workplace therapist show of course i'm your host brandon smith and our topic today is going to focus a little more around leadership. Specifically, what can we as leaders do in 2023 that not only will employees appreciate, but will drive some of those bottom line results? And so to help us on this journey, I've got a reoccurring guest, Jeff Hayden. Uh, if you don't know Jeff, he is a prolific writer. Jeff has uh, written, he writes regularly for Inc. Magazine, uh, thousands of articles on Inc., He's a contributing editor, editor, he's a speaker, ghostwriter, and he's the author of The Motivation Myth. Uh, I've had Jeff on the show before, and I just love our conversations, and today is no different. So Jeff's gonna give us three main things that as leaders we can start doing in 2023 that our team is gonna appreciate, but it's also gonna start to set us up for success. And what I love about his points is they're very much tied into our modern workplace today. So listen real close to our conversation, and of course, stay tuned to the very end, and I'll share my highlights. Jeff, really excited to have you back on the podcast here today, and really excited about our topic. I and mean, you and I did this a little bit of just enough to kind of set the stage but prior to the show today, and I love how relevant and timely it is. So this idea of what can leaders do today that not only improves bottom line, which is important for us as leaders, but that employees truly appreciate today. And you've got some great stories, you've got some great research around that. Uh, so I'm excited about that, but most importantly, welcome back on the show, my friend. Thanks for having me. I, it has been, I realize it's been like two years, so I have to, I have to admit I'm starting to feel a little neglected. Oh, wow. Well, we can't have that. We can't have that happen. But you know, are we going to pass because that's like pandemic time. You know, all, all the years just kind of like bleed together, you know? <laughs> yeah, you, you go ahead and tell yourself that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Be careful what you just said. This this, this may be a little more regular than you're than, than we're right. starting off at. Yeah, uh, it's all good. I enjoyed it last time and I'm I'm tickled to be doing it again. Yeah, last time, which the audience did not get to see, is you gave us a little bit of a, a tour, the, uh, the the studio production team here, a little virtual tour of outside your, your house. Uh, which was which was quite cool, so uh, uh, I won't sh I won't share that for the audience because we need to keep things anonymous. Uh, but but quite cool. Well, yeah, I, I don't think anybody is looking for me, so I think we're safe. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I know when we started to talk about this topic, you you said you had you had gone off and you'd done this conference. So maybe we can start a little bit about that conference, and then we can move right into kind of the the, the topic du jour today. Well, I did the I did the Arabian Business Awards last year, which was a, a, a perfect example of, as I told you a little bit ago, uh, how if you looked at a picture and you're supposed to find the one thing that doesn't belong, that one thing was me. <laughs> uh, but it was really cool. And, and what I decided to do was, if you think about leadership advice, especially, it tends to fall into two buckets. One of them is productivity, efficiency, safety, quality, you know, hard outcomes. And then the other is engagement, morale, you know, developing employees, things like that. But the, the two typically don't really meet. They tend to be, we work on this or we work on that. And so I tried to find things that research supported that were things that leaders could do that employees would appreciate. Yeah. So you've got, a, you've got morale, morale improvement, you've got productivity improvement, you got engagement, you got all the other stuff. And then on the other hand, it also has a bottom line impact. And and there's this this idea sometimes that if you do the the soft stuff, that 
you're spending money, hoping to get money, but you're not going to get a bottom line return. So I tried to find yeah. things and was successful at finding things that you can do to make your employees appreciate what you did, but also that makes your bottom line appreciate that. I love it. So I know we, we targeted a few topic areas and I'll kick us off with the first one. I know the first area that we talked a little bit about prior to the show was about the importance of making sure the promotion process is appropriate or accurate or correct. So I'm going to let you add a little more color to that. What is it about that promotion process that we need to spend time on that's really not only going to help set up the success for the organization, but that frankly people appreciate? Right. I know you have show notes, so I'll, I'll make sure that I get you the study that this refers to. But a, a study looked at basically what happens when promotions are are considered by the employees to be effective and fair. So it doesn't mean that that person got promoted. It just means that they thought that the process was fair and effective. And so when that was the case at companies, they found that productivity metrics for whatever that business did tended to be 30 percent higher turnover rate was 50% lower, so people weren't leaving because they thought that they that the system was unfair. The employees were five times more likely to feel like their leaders acted with integrity, and if it's a public company, then the stock returns exceeded market averages by about five times. Now, I know that all sounds like a lot, wow. but if you think about it, if you think about it, well, I'll, I'll tell you a story. So years ago, I worked for a Fortune 500 company. I was a shop floor employee working my way up, hoping to be a supervisor. And I thought I was close. And so I got an opportunity to work in a startup function in another department to kind of lead the manufacturing effort there. Seemed like a really cool opportunity, but I went to my boss, the manager of the department, and I said, hey, I'm thinking about taking this, but I really want to be a supervisor here. Is this going to derail me? Or should I stay? And he said, oh, no. Yeah. He said, that's only going to make you a better candidate because you're going to have broader experience. So I thought, OK, cool. I'll go do that. So I was over there for about a year. Someone else got promoted to a supervisory role in the department that I wanted to be a supervisor in. I thought, mm, I'm more qualified, experienced. I've got all the stuff better than this person. So I went back to my boss and I didn't complain, but I just said, hey, you know, you know, I want to be a supervisor. What was I lacking? What am I missing? What do I need to work on? And he sat there for a while and he said, you know, I can't really think of anything. I think it was just you were out of sight, out of mind. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and how many okay. times have we heard that story before? So it's totally, told totally me, true. Yeah, you told me to go because <laughs> you said it would be good for me. But then I was out of sight, out of mind. And I have to admit that for a while that messed with me. Um, and so that's just a small story but the the point of it all is that being promoted is a form of recognition and reward obviously you know getting a raise yeah. is good getting a good review is good but if you get promoted that's a really tangible way of saying hey i'm on the right track i'm seen as a high potential person they think there are better things to come for me that's a really positive thing and if you feel like those decisions aren't handled fairly or effectively then obviously it's going to mess with your morale. It's going to cause you to be less engaged and probably less productive. Um, so the the tips that I have for people in terms of making it fair and effective yeah. is the key is to say, what is it that really this job does? What are the things mm. that the person in this job needs to be able to do? And then when that's really clear, you don't have to put out a notice saying, here are the key drivers of performance in this area, but you should through the people that you promote or the way that you recognize people or just the way you structure your business, make sure that that's what that job is supposed to be doing. And so if it's, you know, if it's a sales job and all you really care about is sales numbers, well, then you're going to you're going to promote the people with the best numbers. If it's leadership ability, you want to promote the people that have shown the best leadership ability. So that way, not only when people look and say, oh, OK, yeah, Brandon should have gotten promoted. He's really good at that. I understand that's what that job requires. But if they come to you as a leader and say, hey, where was I lacking? What do I need to work on? You can specifically say, here's what that role requires here's the outcomes that we want from that role here's what you need to work on and be able to demonstrate and show and learn and all of that stuff so that you can be the next person and then if you are sincere with all that and that person is the most qualified person 
you promote them, it's easy, it's fair, it's effective, and everybody is kind of happy. So there's there's a double win to that. One, if you're promoting the right people, your organization wins because you're putting the best people in the best spots. But in a broader sense, you're making sure that everybody else says, yeah, this is a fair place to be. That My leaders have integrity. They are promoting for the right reasons. They are walking the talk that they give us. And if I work hard, I can get somewhere too. So I've got a follow-up question on this. How important is it that as a leader, we are being transparent with the process, with the employee? So for example, you know, if we go back in time to your story, having your manager say, look, Jeff, if you hang out over here in this role for a year, that will round out your skill set, and then let's come back and talk, and then you'll be ready for a promotion. Kind of, you know, putting some kind of a process to it or timeline to it, and then, of course, naturally sticking to it. We've all heard the stories. I've had clients that have said, oh, yeah, my leader promised me a promotion last year, and then now they promised it this year, and they just keep pushing out the, the timeline, and then that just also deteriorates the integrity of the, of the process. But I'm, I'm just curious from your vantage point, how transparent, because sometimes it's hard to be transparent in those situations. So I'm, I'm curious what, you, what your thoughts are around that. I think it's risky to put a timeline, first of all. Okay, because, great you point. Know, if you say, you know, hey, next year, well, a lot of things can happen between now and next year that may make you know, there, there may not even be a promotion to be offering. So I think it has to be more of a, when the time comes, here's the kinds of things that we're going to be looking for. And so here's where you're strong and here's where you can improve. And best of all, if you're doing that and you think the person is sincere about wanting to grow into the role, you add to it. And since these are the things I just identified, here's a couple of things I can do to help you gain some of those skills because then now you're part of the process and you're saying not only I want you to get promoted, but I'm gonna help you get promoted as long as you do your part as well. And then that gives you chances along the way to, to give feedback about how the person is doing. Like I, I was put into a, an informal leadership role in the example we had. And if, that, if my other boss had said, hey, how's it going over there? What have you been doing? I noticed that you've done X and Y and Z, that's really good, but I have noticed that you haven't done A and B and C, you might wanna work on those things. That gives me a chance to assess where I am in terms of am I promotable or not? And so when the time comes, if I don't get promoted, I don't have to hear afterwards, here's where you fell short. I'll know along the way, yeah, there were some places where I was still weak and I, that makes sense to me. So I, I think that Promising a promotion is really risky. Talking about the skills that people need to gain to get there is always really good. But if you've only reserved that for those moments when they either did or did not get promoted, then you missed a chance to develop people along the way. And you also missed a chance to maybe soften the impact of not getting promoted because they will understand why before they come in and talk to you. That's great. So last point, because we could actually sit on just this topic alone for our entire show. It's such a rich topic. Oh, yeah, because I've, I've been not promoted a ton of times. <laughs> <laughs> uh, final question on this. So who owns the responsibility of that conversation? Is it the manager to start it and say, hey, Jeff, we'd love to talk to you about this? Or is it the employee that says, hey, I've been hanging out over here in the satellite office working on this stuff. Just want to give you an update and get your feedback. Both those are you know, important conversations. So I'd be curious your thoughts on that. If you want to be lazy, if you're the manager and you want to be lazy, you can say that this is the employee's job. But there you have a lot of folks who have ambition, who would like to get promoted, but it's an embarrassing conversation to go in. If I had been only a year on the job in a place where there were people with 10, 15, 20 years experience, for me to walk in an office and say, you know, I'd really like to be a supervisor someday. What do I need to work on? It's presumptuous. It's kind of embarrassing. It implies that you think you're maybe better or farther along than you should be. It's just a that's a tough place to go sometimes. And usually by the time the person will come to you and talk about it, they're probably a little disgruntled, a little, a little defeated. They feel like things haven't gone well. So if you take the other approach and just say, my job as a leader, 
my happiness as a leader should come from seeing the people around me succeed. If you look at it that way, then it's very easy to go to somebody and say, what are your goals? What are you looking to do? What do you want to be inside this organization or out? Are there ways that I can help you accomplish that? That way their goals become your goals and vice versa. And then you can manage those conversations along the way. There's, I don't know that there's any better time as a leader spent on anything other than saying to people, I care about you. I want to see you achieve whatever goals you have. If there's ways I can help you, let's do that and let's work on it. And I'll give you feedback along the way. Um, my, my whole, I also hate annual reviews because I think they're, if, I, if anything is a surprise in an annual review, then that's the leader's fault, basically. So my annual review is, it should be really boring because I ought to know everything you're going to tell me. So you can take the same approach with promotions. If you have to tell me after a promotion why I didn't get it, well, I should have known that along the way because we should have been talking about my performance along the way. Yeah, I know I, I went around the barn with that, but that's- No, I think that's beautiful. The short answer is it's a leader's job because not everybody will come to you, but everybody deserves to have the conversation. Yeah. I love how you set that up. It shows it's a sign of respect. It shows you care. Uh, you know, it, it takes some of the edge off the conversation because the employee's not coming with kind of a resentfulness to it. Uh, and you're right, it shouldn't be part of the performance review process. There's a faculty member out in Stanford named Bob Sutton. Uh, he's written several books and he's, yep. he's got, you probably know Bob, and he's got this great saying around performance reviews. He says, if performance reviews were a drug, they would not be FDA approved. <laughs> because research shows 50% of the time performance goes up after a review and 50% of the time performance goes down. <laughs> So, yeah. I think there's, I think there's also there's also studies that show that if people have to come to you and talk about a raise, that even if they get the raise, that it's still a negative because they had to ask. Yeah. You know, you think that you know, and they had to prove somehow that they were worthy of that. When as a leader, it's your job to know if if you came to me and said, "Here's the eight things I've done. I think I deserve more money," and I go, "Yeah, you know, you're right. Let's do that." Well, where was I? <laughs> along the way to not notice the eight things that you've done that make you valuable and should make me want to reward you. Yeah. Or it can also even feel like, well, you're just trying to save a buck. You're, you're trying to right. pay me what you've always paid me, knowing now I'm right. producing more. So right. there's, there's more for the right. bottom line, right? Oh yeah. 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 So it's, it, I, I always think that the conversations are always best coming from the leader because it takes all of the stuff we just talked about out of it. I love that. Big takeaway. Don't be lazy. I love that. <laughs> so, so, all right, so that's our first one. Uh, I know the second one we hinted on a little bit, and I'll set it up just briefly, is making sure you're placing the right kind of managers in the right context. So, yeah. So oh, I'm say, sorry, go ahead. No, say a little more about that. Add some, add uh, some color. So, so there's also, since we were talking about promoting the right people, um, there's other research that shows that, so now we have, you know, you have in-person work, you have hybrid where it's some in the office, some outside, and then you have people that are fully remote. So the researchers asked a ton of employees, what type of leader do you want based on your work setting? And so they found that for in-person teams, the usual suspects reared their head. It was, you know, people that are charismatic, confident, extroverted, you know, all of that stuff. <clears throat> if there was a virtual team, they could care less about any of those qualities. They just wanted doers. They wanted mm. people that were great at planning, that helped prioritize, that stayed on task, helped other people stay on task, smooth roadblocks, all of that stuff. They didn't want the person that could do the rah, rah, we're all in it together, let's fire up and go. They just wanted people that would help them get stuff done. In fact, it was like close to 90% of them wanted that. Um, that's really good news for people that are task oriented and like to get things done if you're hoping to get promoted, as long as your leaders kind of see it that way. Um, and I also think it, it leads to a different point. The whole in out office, return to work, all of that other kind of stuff has changed most people's perception of what the nature of the workplace is. And so I think that people that have returned to the office still see that environment somewhat differently than they used to if they work mm. at home. And so I think I could be wrong, but I think there's a greater focus now on 
I may be at the office, but I've got a certain number of tasks to do and I'm going to do those things. And so promoting people that help people get things done is a much better approach than just going for the old standard, wow, friendly, extroverted, outgoing, you know, charismatic, rah, rah. Um, that only goes so far, especially if the person has to work closely with the team. So the key there is just think about what the nature of the team that you have, if you're promoting a leader, think about the kind of work they do, and then think about what that leader should be able to do with those folks. And if it's a distributed workforce, you need somebody that's really good at organizing, planning, prioritizing, helping people get their jobs done. Yeah, it makes total sense. I mean, you know, when I think about that, even in the context of some of the clients that I talk to, you know, when it's an in-person leader, the, one of the most common words that I'll hear people talk about in the 360 interviews I do is approachability. I want to be able to approach, you know, go to that person, knock on their door, tap on their desk and ask them a question because they're right there. And I want to be able to do that. And that's part of the benefit of being in person, right? We can a little more of that back and forth, iterative right. kind of conversations, water cooler talk for lack of a better term. But yeah, virtually, it's not as, they don't ask for that virtually. Approachability is not so much. They want, they want more clarity. Clarity would be the word. Clarity around roles, goals, priorities, uh, and, and make those conversations be really, really efficient. Uh, right. and, and maybe even less talk about weekend and vacations and a little more about, you know, what, what are your goals for this week? How can I support you? And, and getting a little more well, down I, to brass tacks. I worked for people that were really, really good at the weekend, how's the family, you know, how's it going? They were really, really good at that. But then when you actually needed help with something, they were terrible. And so, you know, it's, it's all fine and good to be, I, th I think everyone should be friendly. What is it? Mark Cuban says that the forgotten superpower is just being nice. Um, so I'm all for that, but nice should also come with some kind of effectiveness, you know? So if I come and ask you for something, you can be really nice about it and helpful and encouraging and help me figure out how to do it. The, yeah. the two don't have to be uh, exclusive. So that's, before we move off of this topic, I've got a follow-on question for you. So does this put an extra burden on managers if you're in a hybrid workplace? It's like you got dual personalities. When everyone's working remotely, I've got to be really, really, I think about clarity and making sure everyone understands. And then yeah, when we're, we're all in the office, I need to almost think about like uh, office hours, right? I need to have an open door and be okay with someone just popping their head in and say, hey, you got a minute? I think that classic... Um, and extroverted and introverted maybe not be may not be the right way to classify it, you know. But the 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 traditional leader that led by personality, let's call it that. Yeah. They were. I think a lot of them were very unsettled by remote work because mm. all of the tools that you had that you could whip out all the time, where you popped in and you know raised a little morale and got people together and got things going and you got your energy from having people around you and seeing them doing things i think they really struggled and and i would be willing to bet although i have no data to support this but you know what the heck i would be willing to bet that some of those folks brought people back to the office and said it was critical that they do so for business reasons just because they were uncomfortable in a different kind of a setting so they weren't thinking what's best for my organization, what makes people most productive, what helps us get the most stuff done. They just didn't feel comfortable not having people around so that yeah. they could see and touch and manage. And so, you know, if you're a leader, what your real job is to get things done, not to feel good about how those things get done necessarily. Yeah. So, and, and, and it's complicated, right? This whole thing is complicated. I, to, on the flip side of that, I had a leader and maybe it's about driving clarity and making sure you really focus on that. And he had an all, all remote team and they ran a region. This was a, this, this leader works for a large retailer and they, all these other leaders run regions. And he said, we're all working virtually. I think we're all working pretty hard. Some of these people are people I hired during the pandemic. So we never really worked alongside each other. He said, we finally kind of built out our command center and outside of one of the stores where the team could come in. He said, once everybody was in there, he said, it kind of opened my eyes. I had more visibility into who was working and who wasn't like right. you got, you got Jose over here and he's just on the phone all the time. And then Susan's over there shrinking coffee, watching him. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> so you said, you know, you, virtually it's, it, it's harder to see that unless right. you really focus on that level of clarity right. and really make right. that, make that a, a priority. Uh, well, ex excellent. So 
there was a third topic that is both a pain point in my world and a pain point in your world, and I'm sure a pain point in many other people's worlds, and that is the dreaded word, meetings. So yeah. my friend, what do you think about this? That is not really a pain point for me. <laughs> yeah. Well, you've, you've, you've effectively removed those from most have, of, most of a, your daily I have, life. <laughs> I have effectively escaped. Um, what is it, another Mark Cuban reference, what is it he says, uh, the only reason he'll attend a meeting is if somebody's writing him a check. Basically, if they're buying something, or they're investing or whatever else, and otherwise it's email. Well, it, well, it, well, it's funny that you say that because when I think of meetings, I immediately think of like that show VH1 pop-up videos, you know, mm -hmm. and, I, and I think of when I'm in a meeting, I, I'm kind of weird, I immediately think of a pop-up that appears above everyone's head and their hourly rate is on that pop-up. And as soon as oh, the yeah. meeting starts, the meter begins running. And if people started viewing meetings that way, I had a I had a leader that got really upset because they were trying to cut costs and they it was this and this group had come in and someone went out and bought like a really bougie luxury cupcake for someone who is having a birthday that day. It's like a ten dollar cupcake. They all celebrated the birthday. Well, she had a two hour meeting to talk about how that was too expensive and they shouldn't be wasting money on the cupcake. That cupcake became real expensive, my friend, after that two hour meeting. That that quickly went from ten dollars to about five hundred dollar cupcake real fast. So I've always I always tell especially business owners, I say next time you're in a meeting with your folks, add up what the effective hourly rate is of every person in the room and decide whether you like writing the check for that, because you are, because it's your company. Do you like writing that check? If you've got ten people in the room and you know, they average even say $20 an hour. It's an expensive meeting. And did you get that out of that? So yeah. if you take that farther, there's a, there was a, a meta analysis of like a decade of different studies that showed that 90% of employees feel that meetings are costly and unproductive and the, the actual data bore that out. So when meetings were reduced by 40% in a whole bunch of different organizations, employee productivity increased by over 70%. So basically, I mean, part of the reason is because if you're not in meetings, you have more time to get stuff done, obviously. Right. So if, if I'm not in four hours worth of meetings, hopefully I'm using that four hours for something productive. But there's, there's other stuff behind meetings that makes me hate them. Um, one of them is one study found that when employees go to a meeting, the average act view of each individual drops by it's 15 to 20%. Wow. That's especially true if you feel like you're a junior member of the group. So if there's a hierarchy to it and, you know, you, Brandon, you're the boss and then there are people different levels, the people at the lowest level, especially their IQ drops. And I think that has more to do with confidence than anything else. If you're if you already feel kind of insecure, you don't confidence matters. Let's just put it that way. And yeah. so those those people don't feel as good about themselves. And then if a person feels whether overtly or implicitly criticized, their IQ drops even further. So right away, by having six people get together, they're not as smart, some of them may be even less smart, and if they feel like they had an idea that other people poo-pooed, they're even less smart. So now not only are you paying the rate that you referred to, but you're also getting less from it because you're not getting the best out of your people. And then there's one more I thought I'll throw in there. If a meeting doesn't start on time, they tend to be a third less effective in terms of actual mm. outcomes than meetings that start on time. Mm. Part of it's because it's the whole drift to a start thing, but also part of it is you lose your momentum, you lose your oomph. There's this implicit, well, okay, if Brandon's late to the meeting, does this really matter? You know, why right. was it important that we sit here? Brandon's time must be more important than ours if he can't be on time. You know, sorry to pick on you, but what the heck. Um, <laughs> so there's all kinds of reasons to not have meetings. And that's especially true when you're trying to generate ideas, come up with solutions. If you're trying to brainstorm, the, the conventional wisdom says, yeah, get a group of people together and let's brainstorm and we're gonna feed off each other and get all these great ideas and everything else. Doesn't happen. The better way to do that is send everybody, send an email, say, here's our problem. Here's what we're trying to solve. Don't lead it. Don't say, here's three things. What do you think about each one of them? Just say, what do you think we should? I'm sorry, let me rephrase that because there's another study I'm gonna cite. What do you think we could do? 
that's an important distinction. Mm. There was another study that showed that if you say to people, what do you think we should do? You tend to get less ideas, less creative ideas, and less optimal outcomes than if you say Five could. Minutes. Because should tends to be narrowing. Should is like, what should we do? Mm. And it usually comes down to this or this. Could is like, all right, we have this problem. What can uh, we do? I like that distinction. Could is more like possibilities. Yeah, should should, should has a, a, almost it like a moral up. moral judgment on it. Like what's well, the right and proper the, thing we should do with our money? Yeah. That was exactly the, the focus of the study was that on moral or ethical questions, it was especially narrowing and limiting because it came down to pretty much an either or. Yeah. Should we do this or should we do that? But if you have this situation, you say, what could we do? Now it opens it up. So send your people an email and say, here's a situation. What do you think we could do? Gather up the ideas. You'll get better ideas that way. Pick out the ones that you think are pretty good. If you have to get a really small group together and say, let's work through these or send it back out and say, here's our top ones. What do you think about that? Um, but the idea that you're going to get better ideas and better solutions by getting a big group together, every bit of research shows that that is not the case. And people will give you much better input and feedback. And the, the people that felt like they're junior, they'll throw their ideas out there because it's a whole lot easier on an email back to you to say, here's three ideas, than it is to float your crazy idea in front of 20 people, all of whom you think are more important than you are, that are higher on the food chain, or that are more likely to criticize your idea. I love so, that. It goes back to that whole like- line, Bottom line, hate meetings. <laughs> Well, I like the fact that you you tie it into psychological safety, right? It's hard to feel psychologically safe in a larger meeting. It could be lots of different levels of people versus just an email. Uh, now, just to play devil's advocate a little bit, do you think there's a time and place for meetings just to foster alignment? So I'll, I'll, I'll share with you kind of an example. I had, a, a, again, doing these 360 interviews, got another client, um, and I'm interviewing someone who's two levels down from her. And the, the person I interviewed said, you know, this person that I was working with, they said, she's amazing. She's gonna be the next chief marketing officer. We all love her. I have no issues with her. But we have a cultural thing in our business. And this is what this person told me. She said, you know, when things get really crazy or there's a fire that pops up, the first thing we do is we cancel meetings so we can all attend, attend, the, fi attend to the fire. She said, that, that's get, I get it, that's great. I, I do get that. But then what happens is I go three or four weeks without talking to my manager. And then when I finally do talk to my manager to share what I'm working on, turns out it's not what they want me to be working on. And now I'm behind or we're behind or another fire's emerged, which then creates more canceling of meetings. So the alignment piece gets lost in that, at least in that example. So I'm curious if you have any thoughts about that. Well, it depends on how you define meeting. So if a meeting is, if I work for you, and we get together once a week to kind of see where I stand and see what progress I'm making and you know stuff like that. I don't really consider that a meeting necessarily, not in that larger sense when you get a lot of people together. That's more of a, you know, let's, let's see where we stand. What can I help you with? How can we make this go? That's a working together situation right. in, in my mind. You know, the meeting is more when you get, especially when you get people from different departments and different functional areas, and you think you're going to bring them all together to foster alignment and engagement and everything else, and it tends to fall apart. So those one-on-ones, yeah, it's okay. If, if you and I were supposed to talk today and a fire came up and you say, hey, we got to work on this, but I'll, I'll catch you tomorrow. Cool. Not a problem, especially if there is a direct outcome from us getting together, which based on the example you gave me, sounds like there is. Staying on track helping me smooth my roadblocks, yeah. all that other stuff. Um, it's the it's the broader meetings where somebody says, hey, we're thinking about doing X, let's get a team together and let's talk about it. Okay, right away it's unfocused <laughs> in general and fuzzy and, and doesn't make any sense. Um, so that that that's kind of what I, I think about. That's where I go with that. Now, Great I do think there are times when bigger meetings make sense, but it only makes sense when the outcome of the meeting is to actually come up with a decision, assign some responsibility for the decision, set some timelines, figure out what it is you're going to do, and then go forth and do. Yeah. If the meeting is to explore, or if the meeting is to, you know, 
build bonds or if the meeting is to, you know, just kind of brainstorm and kick things around or if we're trying to keep people up to date in a, a larger sense, all of that other stuff, sharing information, email works just as good. And in fact, probably better because you don't have all the attending stuff that comes with the meeting. Jeff, this was awesome. This was fantastic. I mean, a great just current refresher on best practices of leadership today in this messy kind of world. And I think we had a, some nice discussion around the messiness. Like it's yeah. not, none of this is necessarily perfectly black and white. There's some gray in here, but there's some new directions we probably need to be considering and taking given the world today. Uh, so I ask do you, all- do you, have, do you have a time, do you have time for a Mark Cuban story? Of course I do. Okay, and because I think it's a good leadership story and it kind of puts a cap, maybe it puts a cap on this. So years ago, <clears throat> I was in Nashville for one of the, the Inc. It wasn't Inc. 5000, it was like an Inc. Groco event or something. And Mark Cuban was going to be one of the speakers. So there was a green room where the, you know, the leading, where the people that were going to be speakers would go. And they had a bunch of volunteers that were there to kind of help put the event on. And one of them, one of the guys, he was a college student. His job was to sit by the green room door and just make sure nobody went in there that wasn't supposed to go in there. He wasn't a bodyguard, he was just kind of filtering. So I would go by and I would go in and out and I would see him and he was there all day. And I thought, I finally said to him, do you ever get a break? Like, do they rotate you, whatever? And he said, well, they're supposed to, but nobody has. He said, but that's okay. And so we talked a little bit and he said, I, I noticed over there that Mark Cuban is supposed to speak a little bit later. I said, yeah, he's should be soon. And he said, I would love to meet him. So <clears throat> I didn't, I went inside and I thought, okay, this kid's been here, sitting here all this time. Maybe I can make this happen. So Cuban arrives, nice guy. He's inside, got there a little bit late. So they're trying to hustle him out the door to get him to the stage. And, and since, sorry for the cursing, you can beep it if you need to, but since I'm often willing to be that asshole, <laughs> I went ahead and I stopped him and I said, Hey, Mark, could you do me a favor? This kid sitting out here, he's been there all day. He's a volunteer, he says he would love to meet you. Could you just take a second and say hi to him? So I get all these looks from all the people trying to get into the stage, like shooting daggers at me, like, <laughs> they were. what are you doing, hold this up, whatever. And he goes, sure, absolutely. So he walks over, asked me the kid's name. I told him, he walks over, introduced himself, says I'm Mark and speaks to him, stands up, talks to him for a little bit, says, hey, let's get a picture. You know, and everybody, of course, is just dying for Cuban to move on. But in that moment, you could just tell that he thought, hey, I can be nice, so why shouldn't I? I can do something nice for somebody else, so why wouldn't I do that? And so made the kids day, Cuban goes off, does his thing, becomes, you know, he's Mark Cuban, he knows how to do his thing. And this kid's glowing, and, and I, just, I just thought, <clears throat> You know, in a larger sense, if you are a leader, you may not be a star, but to the people that work for you, you kind of are because you have some control over their destinies, you have some control over their work life, they look to you for feedback and recognition, you are an important person in their life. And so there are times when you may be busy and you may have lots of stuff to do or whatever it is, but if you just look and say, you know what, I can take a second and I can offer a kind word, or I can be encouraging, or I can just stop by and say, hey, you did a good job on something specific, not just thanks for your hard work, but you did really well on that, and I appreciate it, and it means a lot to me. And that makes such a difference in people's lives, and it costs you absolutely nothing but a few seconds. So that would be my final leadership tip for this time is just, you have more power than you think you do to make people feel good about themselves. So why not use it? Because it costs you nothing. I love that. And it doesn't have to take very long. A minute, 30 no. seconds, two minutes. It can it, it, yep. it just little passing, you know, comment or thought or intention. Yep. That's yep. beautiful. Uh, yep. Well, Jeff, brother, if, if people want to learn more about you or if they want to get copies of, of your more recent book, you know, wh where can they go? Uh, I write for Inc. Magazine, so if you go to Inc., I've got, I don't know, some thousands of articles. Um, it will, it will keep people I, busy I, for a very long time, my friend. Very long I, uh, time. I'm on LinkedIn, and I, I do actually, it takes me a while sometimes, but I do actually respond to people, I promise. Um, and that's pretty much it. Well, as always, thanks for coming on the show. And I didn't forget your comment in the beginning. So we will be having you on sooner than later. 
Fair enough. I, I look forward to it. Thank you, sir. So do I. I loved my conversation with Jeff. I always do. Of course, he's going to have to come on again because it felt like we just scratched the surface and yet we still covered three really important points. So the first point he reminds us, the promotion process is really key. People have to feel, feel like it is fair and effective. And so there's some things we can do around that, both in terms of the conversations that we have with our team members, as well as the transparency around that process that can help to promote that fairness and effectiveness. But if folks feel like that's true, they're more likely to stick around and really invest with us and invest in the team. Second thing he reminds us to do, which I think is so timely today, is match the proper managers and management style to the context of how we are working. So he said, research shows if you're working in an office, people still want the gregarious, open, approachable, motivational manager and leader. The person we can tap on their door and ask them a question. If I'm working remotely, that's actually not what folks want. They want more clarity. They want more uh, conciseness. They want focus. They want to know exactly what they need to be doing. And they want to work with a manager that can help them do those things. So a little more operational than relational. And if we're working in a hybrid environment, we've got to be able to flex. So he reminds us that matching our managerial style will really make a big difference. Employees will really appreciate it and make us more effective. And then the last topic we talked about was meetings and how they are really, really a rough, rough, exhausting part of our day. And so to cut to the chase, Jeff basically says, get rid of most of them. Use emails as much as you can. Keep your one-on-ones. He doesn't count those as meetings, but those group meetings where we're trying to brainstorm or come up with ideas, he said, there's so many better ways to get done with that process than having another meeting. So I took many more notes than just that. I'm sure you've got some highlights of your own, but the real key is what's that one thing you heard Jeff talk about today that you want to start to work into your style as a leader and manager in 2023 that not only your team's gonna appreciate, but really helped you get to the finish line the way you want to. 